I might be a bit rusty. Waiting for Twitch to come online. Here we go. Okay, beautiful. Sounds like the audio should be good, but I'm gonna pop out this chat. If you're watching this in the future, just know that this was originally streamed live and that was on purpose because uh, we're going to go through some, how's my stream looking over there? Okay, beautiful. So we're going to go through some exercises and solutions for replicating our machine learning research paper with PyTorch. Now, this is a really important topic because this is how machine learning advances. And new research gets published with research papers that look like this. And when you first read one of these, if you're quite new to the machine learning field and you're not really aware of what a scientific paper even is, this can be quite intimidating because this is 22 pages of text and numbers and math and graphics. And in fact, I've read through this a couple of times now and I still don't really know everything about this machine learning paper. And I feel like that's okay, that's, that's normal to feel. As you can see, this paper was not authored by one person. It was done by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve people from the Google Research Brain Team. So some of the smartest people in the world have contributed to author twenty seven or twenty two pages of text and math to create this machine learning research. And the research we're looking at is the Vision Transformer page, uh, paper. So the transformer is a type of neural network architecture. I'll just zoom in here. And this was the paper that brought transformers, which were originally created for text data, so a 1D sequence, to Vision. So convolutional neural networks are one of the best computer, uh, computer vision or neural network architecture, sorry, for vision. But the transformer did so well on natural language processing, this research team were basically like, hey, can we use the vision, can we use the transformer, the attention-based architecture, now attention is a learning mechanism, like convolution is a learning mechanism, can we use that for vision? Hence, the vision transformer was born, or VIT for short. So this is what we replicate this paper in the Zero to Mastery uh, PyTorch paper replicating section. We go from scratch. So this is at learnpytorch.io. And if you go to chapter number eight, which says work in progress, we're gonna finish off the last two things that need to be finished off in this stream slash video. But this is a fairly lengthy module of the course. I think it's probably the longest one. You can see it over here. But what we're essentially doing, or you've probably already been through this by the time you watch this in the future, is we go through why replicate a machine learn learning paper? Where can you find code examples for research papers? What we're going to cover, we get specific, we're going to replicate the vision transformer using PyTorch. So that's the whole goal of paper replicating, right? It's to take a machine learning research paper that gets published like this by some very smart people from say Google Research or uh, Facebook AI or OpenAI or DeepMind or you name it insert big university slash tech company, et cetera, et cetera. But what you often wanna do is not just have it as text and math equations on a page. You want to translate this figure, the vision transformer, and these equations over here into code, usable code. That's the whole goal of machine learning research or paper replicating. Now, of course, there is so much machine learning research out there that you're not often, or you're not probably not gonna be able to reproduce it all. In fact, that's another aside, a big problem of machine learning research is having research that is reproducible because machine learning is, or modern machine learning is basically harnessing the power of randomness. So if you're trying to one, harness the power of randomness, but also have it reproducible, as in taking the random out of random, are you really then harnessing the power of true randomness? That's an aside. Let's focus on replicating, well, we've already have replicated this in this module here. What we're going to do in this stream and this 
video because this is recorded live is go through the exercises of this section. So if we come right down here, we go through all the different layers, all the different concepts of the Vision Transformer and right down to exercises. So I'm doing this live uh, so you can see what it's like for me personally to, to go through and do some coding exercises because you're not going to get it first try and I'm going to keep all the errors in here. That's why I do these live. So we've got five exercises here. Replicate the VIT architecture with custom inbuilt PyTorch transformer layers. Turn the custom VIT architecture we created into a Python script. So that way we can, instead of running it as a notebook, you can see how lengthy this notebook is. If we just had it as a .py script, so vit.py, we could import all of our previously written code. We covered that in 05 PyTorch going modular. But then if we keep going, we'll go right back down to exercises. That's why I've got all these little table of contents here. We want to train a pre-trained vit feature extractor model like the one we made in PyTorch uh, paper replicating section 10, which is up here, section 10 on 20% of the pizza, steak, and sushi data. So the whole premise of this milestone project two that we've got here is to adapt the vision transformer to our own problem. So we're working on the problem of Food Vision Mini, which is building a computer vision model to classify images of pizza, sushi, or steak. <laughs> And you'll have to excuse me. My nose has been on the fritz lately. So <laughs> it may randomly want me to sneeze or blow my nose at some point throughout this video, but we'll, we'll persevere. And then we've got a couple more exercises, but instead of reading them out, let's get started, hey? And I've got this PyTorch paper replicating exercise solutions notebook. All I've done is I've just copied the exercises from here these into a notebook. So this is just a fresh notebook. Let's start it on a GPU runtime. Where's the pop out? There's the chat pop out. Beautiful. So let me know if you can hear me by the way, if you're in the chat or if, if there's any issues, I'm gonna move my head up there. That way we'll focus on this. I might just go and grab an antihistamine pill uh, so that if my nose does decide to go on the fritz, hopefully the pill can kick in about halfway through this video. I'll be back in a minute. Excuse me. So let's get started. What we're going to do is we'll start off by importing some necessary necessary libraries. I was about to say necessarily. But if we come up here and we need some base libraries. So things like Torch and import Torch Vision. But of course, when you do these exercises and when you do a lot of coding exercises in general, you will always have access to the internet unless you're doing some sort of test, but this is not a test. We will want to try out our skills, but in terms of copying and pasting imports, well, we've imported code before, so I'm gonna allow copy and pasting for that. So we want to make sure that we're using a certain version of Torch and Torch Vision. That's all that these statements do. Uh, as of July, 2022, not sure when you're gonna watch this, uh, Torch Vision has released 0.13 plus, and that's the minimum version we're going to need. So I'm just going to run this to make sure that we have that. And this little accept is going to install a nightly version of PyTorch if we don't. And I believe Google Colab does have uh, the latest versions, which is good. Then we're going to need some helper functions that we've written throughout the course. 
So if we go to GitHub, all the materials you see here will be on GitHub, by the way. So PyTorch Deep Learning, this is the repo. If you go into Extras, uh, Solutions, once we're finished with this notebook, 08 will live here. But for now, uh, what we're going to do with this little snippet of code, which again, I've got from Section 8 PyTorch Paper Replicating, is we're importing the things that we need. Matplotlib, we'll re-import Torch and Torch Vision, not that we need to, but we do anyway. Uh, just for completeness, we get the transforms, we get NN. We download Torch Info, which is a great package for getting summaries of your models. And then we import our going modular scripts. So in section five, we turned a bunch of our helpful notebook code into uh, scripts. And these are stored on the course GitHub. And then we do some adjustment of the directories so that it works with Google Colab. So if we come up here, the main thing we need is the .py files from going modular. So things like uh, engine.py and data setup.py, engine.py to train our models, data setup.py to pre-process our data. So let's do that. And then we'll set up device agnostic code. And the reason why I'm going a little bit fast through these first steps is because we've, we've covered this a fair bit throughout the, um, throughout the course. And really these are just imports to get set up the real logic behind things of what the exercises we're going to do, we'll do that when we get there. And then of course we need to get some data. So I'll just put a little heading here, get data. I want to download the same data we've been using in Samantha, hello, how are you? PyTorch paper replicating. Oh. We'll download the data and then we'll create the train and test paths. Beautiful. Okay, so the notebook looks like it's probably a bit too, or the GitHub repository looks like it's probably a bit too big. I might try and lower that later on, but that'll be okay for now. And now we want to make sure we download the data and then Pre-process data. Turn images into tensors. Using the same code as um, PyTorch paper replicating section. 2 and 2.1. Get some more code cells here. We're just bringing in all of the pre-processing here. So what we're doing, uh, we've just got a transform to resize our image. We've downloaded some images over here in data, pizza, steak, and sushi. We've got our testing images, which is in classic image classification format. And the same thing for train, we've got pizza, uh, steak, and sushi images. So let's run that. And then we can turn our data or our folders of data into data loaders for PyTorch by running data setup.create data loaders. And if we look in here, we've got going modular, going modular, data setup.py. Here's our create data loaders function. That's what we're going to be running there. So I'll just copy that in there. Oh, I've already done that. So if we wanted to visualize a single image, we could just do some code here. 
We'll just visualize a single image and then we should have everything we need to go. So then we can replicate the vision transformer architecture using PyTorch transformer layers. Pizza, okay, beautiful. And that's a good image because that's the demo image that we used for uh, this here. So this is what we're, we're going to be building. Or well, we did build in this section, but we're now we're going to rebuild it using PyTorch uh, transformer layers. So we have an import, which is an image. Then what happens with the vision transformer is it turns the image into patches uh, because the original transformer model was for sequences of text. So we essentially turn an image into a sequence by flattening it into patches of said image. Then we embed those patches. Then we're going to add a positional embedding. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And a class token embedding at the start there. And then we're going to use it, uh, sorry, we're going to use this transformer encoder layer or really a series of them to learn what's in an image. Then we're going to pass that learned representation to an MLP head. MLP stands for multi-layer perceptron. And that's going to give us our output. So we start from an image, create, turn it into patches, embed those patches, add a positional embedding, add a class token embedding, add several transformer encoder layers. This is what we can use PyTorch transformer layers for to build out the norm, multi-head attention, uh, skip connection here, which is we skip up there and add, and then we build out the MLP block and then output there, stack a bunch of these on top of each other, then put the output into an MLP head, and then we have the output class there. So a fair bit going on, but nothing we can't handle. And of course, that image is just from the vision transformer paper here. So let's, um, we first need to get, what we might do is do a little bit of refactoring here. So what I'll do is I'll get the convolutional layer, which is going to create our patch embeddings. So we create a class in here called patch embedding somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's write down what we need. Need one patch embedding, turn images into uh, embedded patches. Two, we need a uh, transformer encoder layer. This is comprised of alternating uh, MSA, so multi-head self-attention and MLP blocks. And then three, we need um, stack multiple transformer encoder layers on top of each other. And then four, we need MLP head five, put it all together to create that. All right, so excuse me, my nose is just leaking like a tap. Let's run this. Beautiful, there's our patch embedding. So we could actually put the class token and um, position embedding within the patch embedding layer. So maybe we do that, or is there a reason we did it in the full VIT architecture? We'll get to that in a second. So let's just create, get the class token. Or we can create that later on actually. So one. Make patch embedding layer. Beautiful. So what this is going to do is it takes in an input, X, 
and it creates the patch embeddings by doing a convolutional layer over, over an image and then flattening those convolutional feature maps. Now, we can do that because if we look at this little animation up here, this is kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Original image, we cut it into patches. This is what the vision architecture, well, one way of doing it. Apply a convolutional layer. Now, if we adhere to using a kernel size of the patch size, so height and width of the patch, and a stride of the patch size, we can embed our image by using a convolutional layer. Beautiful. So what this original graphic means, if we go back to the vision transformer, here, a linear projection of flattened patches is what it's doing is it's turning the image pixels into a learnable representation. That's an embedding. Uh, the benefit of turning uh, an image patch rather than just using the numerical values of the image patch itself in terms of uh, red, green, and blue va values, the benefit of using an embedding is that it can be learned over time so that our model learns and updates a representation of our image rather than just keeping with the static image itself. So when we pass it through a convolutional layer, the convolutional activation or the feature map from the convolutional layer forms that linear projection or embedding of our flattened patches. And then to really create the flattened patches because the output shape of the Conv2D won't necessarily be this flatten sequence, we flatten the last two layers of that or the last two dimensions, sorry. So if you'd like to figure out what's going on here, you can step through the sizes of what's happening here. But let's keep pushing forward. Let's now create a transformer encoder layer. So this is what we want to build, the transformer encoder, which is comprised of alternating MSA and MLP blocks. And so the whole goal here is to replicate it with transformer encoder layer. So transformer encoder layer, so this is from PyTorch. PyTorch has a bunch of uh, built-in transformer layers. Or maybe we just go to torch.nn. I don't want dropout, I just want nn. Yo, Jordan, what's happening? So if we, yeah, we go to transformer layers here in torch.nn. We've got transformer, transformer encoder. There we go, that's what we're after and transformer encoder layer. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these two uh, encoder layer and encoder with each other. So transformer encoder layer is made up of self attention, which is this multi-headed attention and a feed forward network, which is this. Now, the thing about machine learning and deep learning is that you'll find the same thing, such as in this case, an MLP has several different names. So feed forward network or dense network is often another term for MLP and MLP is multi-layer perceptron. So it's typically a layer or a series of layers with a number of hidden internal layers. So MLP usually stands for a neural network with multiple layers. However many layers you want, you could classify it as an MLP. But in this case, in the transformer case, it's only got two hidden layers. So if we look up MLP consists, yeah. Uh, MLP contains two layers with a JLU nonlinearity. And so this little block here, because transformers have been so popular and widely used, they are now built into the PyTorch library. So let's try and make one of our own using this one here. So I might just bring this over there because this is what we want to do, transformer encoder layer. Samantha, yes, we are implementing transformers with PyTorch.
Okay. So if we go. Maybe we create, you know what? I think we can create this. Transform encoder. Yeah, I think we can go um, transformer encoder layer. It's going to be this one here. So we've got NN available. Let's go NN dot transformer encoder layer. Now the D model, the D value here of the model is going to be the number of expected features in the input. So I might just make this a bit bigger. D model. We're going to use 768. Where did this number come from? This is from table one. So table one is, yeah, the hidden size D. So that's our dimension of our model, so our embedding size. We're going to start by implementing VIT base, but because this is uh, code, you could easily just adjust it. And these are all parameters, so you could adjust it if you wanted to build the larger variant as well. Uh, I'm gonna stick with VIT base. So then we need N head, which is the number of attention heads that we need. So if we look in here, we have 12 heads. So that's for multi-headed attention. And then we have dim feed forward, which is equal to the number of hidden units in our MLP layer, which is here. So number of heads was how many heads in multi-head attention. So if we go back down to here, we're now up to what is the hidden unit size of our MLP or feed forward layer. In this case, it's 3072. Again, all of these are hyperparameters you could change if you want, but we're just sticking with implementing VIT base. Dropout, what dropout do we apply to the feed forward layer or the MLP layer? Uh, and then we have an activation, which is going to be a string. So Jellu or Relu. I'm going to put this in as Jellu. And which is, of course, Torch NN Jellu. Gaussian area linear, linear units function, which is a nonlinear function. Uh, recall that most or basically all neural network architectures are just a series of layers of linear and nonlinear transformations. So I like to think of it is if a neural network is finding patterns in data, what patterns in data could you find if you could draw an unlimited amount of linear lines, so straight lines, and nonlinear lines? You could find some pretty darn good patterns with those functions there. Um, layer norm, we're going to leave that by default. It's going to be 1 times 10 to the power of negative 5. That's fine. Batch first. I'm going to set this to batch first equals true. Uh, because I'm going to be passing my images into transformer encoder layer uh, with the batch dimension coming first. So let's just make a, an example random image. Rand image tensor, which is going to be torch.randn. We'll give it a shape of 1224, 224, 3. So that's a batch size of 1, a height of 224, a width of 224, and three color channels. So rand image tensor dot shape. And then if we go patch embedding, what happens if we pass it through here? So patch embedding equals patch embedding. Now the hyperparameters here are the in line with VIT base from table one. The patch size is the size of the patch that we break the image into, such as up here. So that's what we're breaking our images into, a patch size of 16 by 16. So I'm just gonna create that, and then I'm going to pass in our patch embedding rand image tensor just to see 
what happens? Oh, patch size is not defined. Patch size. Oh, this should be self.patch size. Has no attribute patch size. Oh, I didn't even define it here. Self.patch size equals patch size. Patch size is not defined. Hold on. Is there some indentation issue going on here? Patch size. Ah. <laughs> you don't know what you can't see. Oh, PyTorch is color channels first. Excuse me. See, this is why I keep the errors in. Color channels first. There we go. Okay. Patch embedding output. So let's go. Input shape, rand image tensor dot shape. Output shape, uh, we want patch embedding output dot shape. Beautiful, there we go. Okay, so this is what our patch embedding layer is doing. It's taking our image from three dimensions or two dimensions, 224 by 224 and it's flattening it into a sequence of 196 patches and giving it embedding size of 600 and or sorry 768 my dys dyslexia kicked in a little bit there and that number is again from table one so there's a few pieces of the puzzle here that we have to pay attention to but we're slowly working towards it now let's jump back into this transformer encoder layer we've got a random image here once we pass it through, we kind of have to gonna keep jumping around here. Once we pass our image through the embedded patches layer, we need to pass it through an in transformer encoder layer. And if we want to reproduce this transformer encoder just like the vision transformer paper, well, we can use this layer from PyTorch. We've passed it in the dimensionality of our embedding, which is right here, 768. We've said we want 12 heads of multi-head attention. We want a feed forward layer or an MLP layer with 3072 hidden units. All the hyperparameters we're using are from table one of the VIT paper. We're using a dropout of 0.1 because if we go dropout uh, 0.1, that's what we want to use. And then if we go activation or if I just search Jello, yeah, there we go. The MLP contains two layers with a JELU non-linearity. And then batch first equals true. We have an image that is batch first. So this is batch size, uh, color channels, height, width. Beautiful. So let's keep going with this. I believe there's one more, maybe two more parameters we should pay attention to. Norm first, yeah. So norm first, we can go true. Why do we do that? Well, because if we look at the structure of the vision transformer, it's got norm first. So, and if we read here, if true, layer norm is done prior to attention and feed forward operations. Otherwise it's done after. So we're doing norm first and batch first. So look at that, there's our transformer encoder layer. Let's have a look at what this looks like. Wonderful. So do you see what the beauty of PyTorch pre-built layers is offering us? We have here about, I don't know, eight lines of code, but if that, you could really condense this into one if you wanted to. 
And then we have a transformer encoder. Uh, so we've got self attention, multi head attention. There it is there. Uh, then we've got linear. Now I believe this might not be in order. Lionel, yeah, this is not in order, I don't think. But we've got multi-head self-attention. Let's just line them up. Uh, dropout is going to be between the dense layers in the MLP. So if we search again here for dropout, uh, dropout, I need to make this a bit bigger. Dropout when used is applied after every dense layer, except for the KQV projections. So KQV is query key value projections that come from attention. So there's no dropout after the attention layer. And where do, where do we go? Where's dropout? Uh, but there is directly after the positional and patch embeddings. So dropout here is used within the MLP layer. Now, I'm sorry for keeping the jump around, but this paper, there's quite a lot of pieces of the puzzle to unpack here. And so that's why we're jumping around. Yeah, there we go. Figure one. So dropout's going to be used after the linear layers that are within the MLP. And what does dropout do? Well, it's a regularization, so it helps to prevent overfitting by randomly dropping out connections between layers. And then hopefully the theory is that the connections that remain uh, are better or more generalizable than if you had access to all the connections. So now, what do we wanna do? Let's get a summary of this, hey? I always like to get a summary. So from Torch Info, import summary. This is why we installed Torch Info at the start. So let's get a summary of model equals transformer encoder layer. Now the input shape that we're going to be putting in here is going to be this shape because the output shape of the patch embedding layer is what goes into the transformer encoder. So if we put in the wrong shape here, let's just try, um, I think it's input size here. Uh, we'll go one, Two two four or one three two two four two two four. What happens if we just put in our default image size? Yeah, there we go. Given normalized shape seven six eight. Expected input with shape star seven six eight, but got input of our size. So wrong shape. But now we pass in the patch embedding output dot shape. Let's see what happens. Is this gonna work? Oh, there we go, friends, look at that. Okay, so here we go. We've got in a few lines of code, we've replicated a transformer encoder block. So I'll let you look up what each of these layers does behind the scenes. We're just focusing on writing code here. So we've got layer norm, which is norm. We've got multi-head attention, which is multi-head attention. We've got dropout, which comes after the multi-head attention layer. We've got another layer, layer, layer norm here. Uh, then we've got a linear layer and layer norm, layer norm. I'm not sure what the ordering of these two is, but then we've got dropout after that and dropout. Okay, so I think the ordering here is a little bit messed up, but we've got basically the structure of our transformer encoder, or at least all of the pieces of the puzzle. So that was the goal of exercise one, replicate the VIT architecture we created in, with inbuilt PyTorch transformer layers. But now we have to, or we want to stack on top of each other um, transformer encoder layers. So LX, layer times X. So the VIT, model VIT base uses 12 layers of a transformer encoder. So to make the transformer encoder, we want to stack 12 of these on top of each other. So we can do that with PyTorch as well. Stack um, transformer encoder layers on top of each other to make the full transformer encoder. 
So according to table one of the VIT paper, um, the VIT model uses a stack of 12 transformer encoder layers. So we can stack transformer encoder layers on top of each other using, and we go back into here, we want transformer encoder. So transformer encoder is a stack of N encoder layers. So the transformer encoder layer is made up of self-attention and a feed forward network. Uh, an encoder, just for reference, is encoder is a way of saying, hey, we're going to turn some data into a numerical representation to try and find patterns in that data. A decoder is it deconstructs a numerical representation into some human interpretable representation, or, well, that's the general premise of it. So encoder, turn data into a numerical representation that is learnable. Decoder, take that learnable numerical representation and translate it back to human understandable. So let's bring this in here. And I'll make a code cell there. So what does this take? I'm gonna bring this one over here. I might already have it. Yeah, that I do, don't I? So we want to currently stack our single transformer encoder layer into 12, the VIT base model that is, uses 12 transformer encoder layers. So let's go transformer encoder equals nn dot transformer encoder and then in here we can pass it our encoder layer which is transformer encoder layer then we can pass it num layers is going to be 12 because that's what vit base has uh, the normalization component we don't need we don't need that I think that's all we need to do. How cool is that? We've just stacked together a transformer encoder. Now let's have a look. Oh my goodness, we've got a lot of layers there. So let's not get the output of that. That's a bit too long for me. I would prefer we go and get the summary. I like this. Maybe we're gonna get the same thing, but that's all right. So summary model equals transformer encoder. Now, what is going to be the input shape to this or the input size? Well, it's going to be the same as the patch embedding. Do I have tab order complete? Yeah. Embedding output dot shape. Beautiful. We're well on our way to creating a transformer, a vision transformer already. So have a look at this. We've got transformer encoder layer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How good is that? Okay, so we have a few more components left, but what I might do is comment that out so our notebook's not getting too big. What else do we need? We have the patch embedding, we have the transformer encoder layer, which is comprised of alternating MSA and MLP blocks. We've stacked multiple transformer encoder layers on top of each other. Uh, the MLP head, I think we can put it all together and create a VIT as it is. Or maybe we can go MLP head equals nn.sequential. Now, this is possibly the most straightforward one. Or actually, I think we can put this into a class now. So, five, put it all together and create VIT. So, we're skipping step four, so that can be incorporated into the overall uh, 
bit architecture. So this is where we can put together everything that we've built so far. So we've got a patch embedding module, which is going to be, let's go back to the vision transformer. Recall this exercise is just replicating this architecture using completely PyTorch inbuilt layers. Um, so we have the patch embedding, which is going to create the linear projection of flattened patches. We still haven't done the class token or the positional embedding, but we'll get to that in a second. We've built the transformer encoder stack. We did that with transformer encoder layer, which made one of these, but then we saw that a uh, vision transformer is actually a stack of these on top of each other. And so we've done that here by stacking our single transformer encoder on top of each other. And now we can put it together in vision transformer mode. So we need to create this overall architecture. So let's start by creating a class, class vit. And we want to subclass nn.module. Is this, is this viewable? Yeah. Um, and then we're going to init, initialize self. Um, we'll get image size. We'll just make sure that it's the same as the patch size. So 16. And then what else are we going to need? We're going to need embedding dimension, 768. So I'm going to prepare this with hyperparameters from table one. Yeah, there we go. So let's go 768. Dropout equals 0 0.1. MLP size equals 3072. And then I want um, num transformer layers equals 12. And then what am I missing here? Embedding dimension, oh, num heads equals 12. And let's see how far this gets us. We can put in more parameters there if we need to, but I'm going to super this. Init, okay, let's start with one. We want the patch embedding. I think that's the right place to start with. Patch embedding. Or we might just assert Um, assert image size, oh, maybe number of channels. Assert image size is divisible by um, patch size because it won't, it won't work if we have an image that can't be cut into a certain number of patches. So 224 divided by 16 is 14, I think. Yeah, so we got 14. So let's go assert. What we're doing is we're just stacking together all of the pieces of the puzzle to create vit. Uh, assert, image size, modulo, patch size equals equals zero. Um, image size must be divisible. So let's create the patch embedding, and then maybe we go um, to create class token, which is this over here, class token. And then three, we want to create positional embedding. We'll see how to do that. Four, we can go transformer encoder, or maybe the dropout because there is dropout after the embedded patches. Now this is where there's a little bit of a treasure trail in this paper. You see a dropout, this isn't until uh, appendix B.1 that we find out this little detail. So dropout when used is applied after every dense layer 
So that's going to be in the MLP. Our transformer encoder layer class will take care of that, except for the KQV projection. So there's no dropout after the self-attention mechanism in here, but that's okay. That's taken care of in uh, our transformer encoder layer as well. But also directly after adding the positional to patch embedding. So we need um, create patch plus uh, position embedding dropout. So we need to drop out just after our positional embeddings uh, if we're replicating the paper. Self dot embedding dropout equals nn dot dropout. And we're going to use p equals dropout, which is up here. Because if we look at table three, now this is what I mean by there's little details everywhere around this paper. Um, dropout value, there we go. So we're kind of jumping around, but that's okay. We'll bring it all back together in a second. So we want to create transformer I'm just doing the scaffolding here. Um, six is single create stack of transformer encoder layers. Uh, seven is create MLP head. Oh, that's what we might want, number of classes. num classes. This is actually probably the easiest layer here. MLP head equals nn.sequential. We will go nn.linear in features is going to be embedding dim. Now that's a, a handy thing about transformers is that the embedding dimension stays the same throughout the entire architecture. So the output of the transformer encoder block uh, will be the same as the embedding dimension. So um, the input here to the linear layer, the last layer of our network, will be the same as embedding dimension. Uh, however, the out features, we want to convert it into num classes. So by default, we'll set this to a thousand. Say we were working with ImageNet. Um, I will put here num classes. But there's also a layer norm here. Layer norm. Now that is directly from equation four. Equation four. So these four equations represent the entire vision transformer architecture. We've just done number four, layer norm linear. Um, let's start by doing the patch embedding. And then this is the multi-head self-attention, which is this block here. And then MLP number three is this here. But again, this is taken care of, care for us by the transformer encoder layer, this one here. So let's do the patch embedding. We want self dot patch embedding equals patch embedding, which is our patch embedding class up here which is going to take in channels, patch size, embedding dim. So we want in channels equals in channels, patch size equals patch size, um, and embedding dim equals embedding dim. Now we truly could do the, oh, num channels, sorry. We could do the class token and position embedding within the patch embedding layer, but I'll leave that as a little extension if you want to try it out yourself after you see how we do it here. Excuse me, just had to blow my nose. Um, so this is where we want to add the extra learnable class token, or we want to create it more say. So in order to perform classification, we use the standard approach of adding an extra learnable classification tokens to the sequence. So whenever you hear learnable, um, I think they use it a lot, or linear embed. 
to me, I'm understanding these two as similar concepts. So an embedding or a learnable token or a learnable vector are all different names for the same thing. A transformer is essentially a stack of embeddings on top of each other. And so the, the power of embeddings is that you're creating a learnable representation. And what I mean by that is, as we said at the start, rather than just using the image numbers or a token of the actual value zero, I'll zoom in here a bit, rather than using the actual value zero, we're making these values updatable. So as our network goes through epochs and iterations, the representation it forms of the data, whatever that is, often we can't interpret it ourselves unless you build a bunch of tools to do so, because it's a big just pile of numbers. Well, that pile of numbers can be updated through several iterations after looking at different data samples rather than just being static. So if it was static, it wouldn't really help because it's like, hey, we can do that ourselves. The whole point of an embedding is so that it can be updated. How you represent your data in terms of the embedding is generally how well your model can learn. The better the embedding, the more chance or the uh, more ca uh, potential your model has to learn. So that's whenever you see learnable or vector or embedded vector or linear embed, it's you're creating an embedding to form a representation of your data that can be learned and updated over time. My friend, who's a machine learning engineer, would always say, it's always about the embedding. So let's go here, we'll create the class token. Now, this is something that we're going to need to operate on in the forward method, but we're gonna see this in a second. So the class token is just going to be uh, the shape we only want to prepend it to, so prepend is in prepend instead of append, prepend at the start. We just need a torch, uh, sorry, parameter for a torch. We're gonna to start with random, uh, one, one, and then embedding dim. Does that make sense? So let's just see what this looks like. Recall that NN parameters have the uh, attribute requires grad equals true, which means they are learnable. They're going to, PyTorch is going to track its gradients behind the scenes and update it when we do gradient descent, when we call optimizer.step. Uh, embedding dim, oh, I might just define it here. What did we do wrong? Oh class token. Uh, class token. Yeah, there we go. Or maybe that's the wrong size. No, that's not what the shape we want. We want it to be, we need to calculate the number of patches here. So, excuse me, we don't actually want that there. I believe we want it here. So, we want, which dimension do we want it across? Oh no, that is part of the embedding. I'm trying to do this without referencing my own code. <laughs> this is why you save things. Let's have a look here self.class token. Oh, we were right in the first place. Trust your instincts, Daniel. So, and if we go requires grad, okay, beautiful. We've created the class token, which is this little token here, this token here. So patch embedding, creates the linear pro projection of flattened patches. We've just created the class token, which is this little star here. Now let's create the positional embedding. This is where we'll need to calculate how many patches we have. Positional embedding. So positional embedding is as well learnable. Does it have here? Add position embeddings. Yeah, so embeddings is the key word here. We have linear embed, which is the same word for embeddings, and we have learnable, 
classification token, which is for same word as embedding. So parameter, we want learnable, and we're going to go torch rand and we create it. I'm, I'm starting it off as random because machine learning is all about harnessing the power of randomness. So it's gonna start as a random number, but then hopefully be improved over time. Now we haven't calculated number of patches yet. So I might just calculate num patches here. Num patches equals, um, we have a formula. So image size, let's just, we'll, we'll make it mathematically correct. So to handle 2D images, we reshape the image into X is an element of a real number with dimension height times width times color channels into a sequence of 2D patches, XP, which is an element of a real number of shape uh, N for number of patches times patch squared times color channels where height and width is the resolution of the original image. And so if we look up here, training resolution is 224. That's why I put my image size as 224. So I'll just write this from table three. And this is from table one. This is also from table one. So basically table one and three define the hyperparameters of our model from table one, from table one, and then generic number of classes. This can be adjusted. So let's go back to where we were, figure one. Figure one, we're calculating the number of patches. So N is the number of patches equals height width divided by p squared. So we can do image size times image size divided, divided um, patch squared. So patch size times two. So n equals height width divided by p to the power of that. So that's gonna be our positional embedding. So let's copy this down here and have a look at this one. Num patches, we'll just calculate this by hand, equals um, 224, 224 by 224. So that's our image size divided by, uh, we'll just write patch size. Or maybe we'll write image size as well. Patch size equals 16. And we'll go patch size squared. Image size. Image size. Boom, look at that. Okay, so, um, Pause embedding. So the positional embedding, what is that for? Well, it's to keep track of where the patches appear in a sequence. So if we just flattened our image into a sequence, well, then our images don't really relate to each other. As in this patch, this patch here, which is actually there. So this patch of the image is actually there. When it gets flattened into a sequence, that spatial information of where that patch occurs in the image isn't really there. So that's why we incorporate the learnable position embedding so that we know, or the model knows per se, that this is the order of the patches that they come in. So 0, 1, 2, or 0, 1, 2, 3, yeah, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's 9 there. And so that way, hopefully some spatial information of where these pixels relate to the rest of the image gets incorporated into our model. That's one of the benefits of convolutional neural networks is that as a convolutional sliding window goes along, it keeps in mind or keeps track of which pixels come in which order. 
So pause embedding dot shape. There we go. So the shape of the positional embedding, if we come down here, is stated in here, which is an element of R n plus one. So number of patches is 196 uh, times D, which is D is the embedding dimension. Beautiful, we've got our positional embedding. And we've got our class token, and we've got our uh, embedding dropout. Now we can create our transformer layer. Oh, friends, we are getting very close to transformer encoder layer. To building a VIT, a vision transformer, from basically scratch with pure PyTorch layers. And my mouse is, I think it's just got some dust built up. Just having an absolute field day. So let's keep going. We're gonna go NN, we want this as a transformer encoder layer. Is this big enough, by the way? Maybe that's better. It's just hard to, to position everything because this is like, it's non-linear, this paper. It's like there's things all over the place. We're trying to code as well. So just let me know if it's not big enough. So we need D model, which is going to be our embedding dimension. So D is stands for dim or dimension or dimension or I don't really know. But we have embedding dim. And then what else do we have? We have N head, which stands for number of attention heads, which in our instance is uh, num heads. number of multi-head self-attention heads. Now, of course, if you wanna look up what multi-head self-attention is, that'll be some extra curriculum. We're just focused on writing the PyTorch code. Um, number of heads, we had feed forward, so that's our MLP size. So dim feed forward equals MLP size. What else do we need? Batch first equals true. Oh, activation. We want to use Jellu. Batch first and norm first, true. Wonderful. So there's our transformer encoder layer. And then let's go self transformer encoder. So that's a single layer. This is just a single block, so st stacked, stacked single layers. So now, if we go back to figure one, this is this, the standard transformer encoder layer. Now, there are many different variations, as it turns out, of the transformer encoder layer but we're just sticking with replicating the vision, uh, sorry, the vanilla vision transformer. Because I think it's important just to start with the, the baseline one, and then when you've got experience building the baseline one, you can customize it to your heart's content. So now all we want to do is stack uh, on top of each other, transformer encoder, our encoder layer, which is going to be equal to self dot transformer encoder layer, and num layers is going to equal 12. Look at that. We've got all the pieces of the puzzle for our vision transformer. So now we need a forward method. So the forward method is going to connect all of these. So let's create the forward method. The forward says, hey, what do you want me to do when you call me? So when we instantiate our VIT model, Ford is going to say, if I pass you some data in the form of X, I want you to take these steps. So let's first get some dimensions from X. Um, we want batch size equals X dot shape zero. Uh, and then we want to, let's create the patch embedding. So we will go patch embedding equals self dot 
patch embedding on X. So then we're going to get an output from the patch embedding, which is equivalent to what we've got up here. This size. So that's our output shape. We'll see this, you could see this by printing the shape, but we'll just trust that this is the right thing. This is the right size. If we're using an input image of random image, demo image equals torch.randam1. This will be our demo size tensor, which is just random numbers of the image size that we want to use. So now we want to or prepend the class token to the patch embedding. So what we've done is we've just used our patch embedding layer to create this which is the pink tokens here, except for this little star. So we're gonna go star and then we're gonna go purple. So star is the class token, which is up here. However, we need a class token per image in our batch. So the issue we have now is that if we passed in uh, rand n, or 32, let's go up here, a batch size of 32, just to demonstrate. 32, what's going to happen here? Yeah, random image tensor, which is actually 32 batches or a batch size of 32. We now have an output shape of 32 here instead of what our default class token is for one. So we have to expand our class token across the batches. So rather than just having a dimension of one here, we need it to go across 32 or across however many images we have in our batch. So that's why we are getting the batch size here. So let me just demonstrate what we're going to do. So let's go here. Let's give it, uh, say our default batch size is 32 and our class token dot shape, print, we've got one, one, seven, sixty-eight, but we need to, we want to keep this same class token uh, across the 32 batches. So let's see what happens when we expand uh, our class token across the batch size dimension. So I think we can go class token dot expand, and maybe we go, uh, batch size, negative one, negative one. Now, this is another little tidbit, is that negative one means um, to infer the dimension. So what we've said is, hey, class token, expand yourself over batch size as your first dimension. So that one is going to be expanded to 32, if we've done it right. And then the remaining dimensions are going to be whatever they already are. So instead of explicitly hard coding the dimensions, we could just go one here or 768. What if we wanted to change the embedding dim later on to say 2000? I'm making numbers up here, but just for example. So that's the benefit of using negative one. It kind of means, hey, infer the dimension. Let's see what happens. Um, so we see we've got it expanded there. Let's get the shape of it. Beautiful, that's exactly what we wanted to happen. We've now got a class token expanded across each image. So this line of code up here creates a class token for a single image. However, we can get the batch size of whatever our input is, that's why we get it down here. I think that's why I didn't do it in the patch embedding layers because we want to dynamically increase our class token when necessary. But I guess we could do it because we're passing X into the patch embedding layer. Yeah, I think you could still do it as part of the patch embedding layer, but alas, let's go uh, class token equals self.class token dot expand over the batch size, negative one, negative one. So negative one means infer First, expand the class token 
across the batch size. Infer the dimension. And then we can prepend it to. We need to add the class token to the start of the embedding, to the patch embedding. So what we've done is we've got this. We now want to prepend this class token. And if we come down, this is part of equation one. So there's the embedding that we've created here. Now this is the, uh, oh sorry, we've created this with the patch embedding. The position embedding we haven't added yet, but we're doing this little step here, the class token. So let's go uh, patch embedding class token. Or maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe we just keep it as X. X, X equals torch dot cat. Now we want to concatenate the class token to X. And what dimension do we want it on? We want it on dimension one. Why dimension one? because we want to add that number or this one to the patch embedding. So if we come up here, this is where the input and output shapes of a layer gets really important. So this is going to be batch size, uh, num patches, embedding dim. So we don't want to concatenate our class token to the batch dimension. We want to add it to this dimension here, dimension one, num patches, because that's our patch uh, embedding. Or do we? Let's find out what the output shape is here. Print x dot shape. Let's see if this works. Vit equals vit. Vit. What do we get? Normalized shape. Oh, so for the layer norm, we need to pass in a variable here. If you want to know what layer norm does, uh, papers with code has a great explanation. Normalization normalizes across the embedding dimension. So we need to pass in normalized shape is the embedding dim. Beautiful, okay, that's what we wanted. So what we've done is, so if we go through our patch embedding, there we go, okay. So we pass it through the patch embedding, which is going to be this. Then we prepend the class token to dimension one. So when we prepend the class token to dimension one, we add it to this dimension. So we've gone from 196 to 197, which lines up perfectly with the shape of our positional embedding. Because what is the shape of our positional embedding? It is 1197768. So the batch size is arbitrary here in this case, because we're going to be adding the positional embedding to this tensor here. So as long as these two dimensions line up, then we're in the right place. So we can now add the positional embedding. So do you see what we've done here? We've created the patch embedding, which is a learnable or a linear projection of our image patches. We created that using a convolutional layer. 
and they actually say that you can do that here in the paper. As an alternative to raw image input patches or image patches, the input sequence can be formed from feature maps of a CNN. So that's what we've done here. Then we've created the learnable class token, which is up here, learnable class token. Then we've created the learnable position embedding, which is, and all this time we're adhering to the fixed shapes that are stated in the paper, which is uh, the embedding dimension is of shape P squared, so number of patches squared. So in our case, we have 196 as our number of patches for our image size and a patch size of 16 times color channels times D, which is 768. Uh, and then we have, or dot C, so a patch across all the color channels. And then we have a positional embedding, which is of size M plus one, so number of patches, 196 plus one, which is 197, and then an embedding size of D, which is 768. So we're really moving along here. Let's go add the positional embedding to uh, patch embedding with class token. So X equals uh, self dot positional embedding plus X. So we'll add it to itself. Then we can go print x dot shape. There we go. So we're not gonna see a change in shape here, but behind the scenes, the numbers are going to update in some way, shape or form. And in fact, because they're all created randomly, it doesn't really matter to us like what they're going to be. Is What matters more to us is that they're all learnable and they can be updated over time. So we'll keep going. Now we need to do drop out on patch plus positional embedding. So we want uh, X equals embedding dropout. Embedding dropout on X. Hey, oh, I need self there. And then we want to go pass um, embedding through transformer encoder stack. We need self dot transformer. Uh, is it just transformer encoder? Yes, it is. X, and then pass zeroth index of X through MLP head. So why are we doing this? Well, it's because if we look at the figure, this line is kind of a little bit hard to understand, but what it's saying is that they're only passing the first token, so the class embedding token to the MLP head. Now you could average across the outputs here, that would be equivalent to global average pooling and passing the input here. But because we're sticking with just replicating the vanilla vision transformer, we pass just the zeroth index of the output of the transformer encoder to the MLP head. So this will look like this equation. So Z zero. So if we read here, similar to Bert's class token, we prepend a learnable embedding to a sequence of embedded patches Z00 equals X class, that's our class token here, whose state at the output of the transformer encoder, so the output of the transformer encoder, in our case, is here, serves as the image representation Y. So Z0 of the output of this. So this is equation four. So let's do this, we'll go X, self.mlp head and we're going to pass it x we're going to index on we want all of the batches because right now the size is 32 so we want 
all of the batch dimensions, but then we only want zero there. That's all we want. And then we're going to return X. So how many classes do we have? Equals len class names. And then what do we get from this? Return X. We should get three outputs here. Oh my goodness. Oh no, we got 32. Is that going to be faster if we just go through again? Let me change this to one. Ah, oh, so this is happening on the CPU too. Oh no. We crashed it. Let's put it on the GPU, hey? There we go. Okay. Three outputs because we've said we want length class names, which is three. Beautiful. Look at that. We've just created a vision transformer with PyTorch layers. And we're missing one little printout somewhere. Oh, there. That's okay. So, vision transformer. We create the patch embedding. Let's just step through it one more time. We create the patch embedding, which is this layer here. This layer. We create the class token, which is that little star there. And then we create the positional embedding, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we create the embedding dropout, which isn't really pictured here. So that's a little, a, a, a bit of a hard thing to, to fully replicate because it's not visually just anywhere here. You kind of have to read the whole paper to find that little tidbit. Uh, and then we create the transformer encoder layer as a single layer, which is this here. Then we create the stack of transformer encoder layers because you'll see here that this is LX. So in table, oh, we maybe put this as num transformer layers. Yeah, you don't, I don't really want to be hard coding hyperparameters there. So we'll fix that. We create that. And then we create the MLP head, which is this here, which out features is number of classes. Then we go through the forward method and we step through all the layers that we've created. We pass in an image X. We get the batch size of that. So this will work for an arbitrary number of batch sizes. And then we break it into a set of, uh, or a sequence of linear embedded patches. But in our case, our patch embedding layer is using convolutional or a conv2d layer to create the embeddings. Then we create the class token and expand it across the batch size. So we have one class token per image in our batch. Then we prepend the class token to the front of the linear projection of flattened patches. Then we add the positional embedding, the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, to our linear projection of flattened patches, as well as the class token. We perform dropout, so there really should be a dropout layer in between these two, 
So these arrows here is a dropout layer. Then we pass our embedding here through our stack of transformer encoders. And finally, we finish by passing the zeroth index of the output of the transformer encoder to the MLP head and we return X. In our case, we get three outputs here because we're working with three classes. But that is a vision transformer in PyTorch with pure PyTorch layers. So, well done. Let's, uh, let's get a summary of it, hey? Summary, model equals vit and input size equals demo image dot shape. There we go, friends. Oh, what have we got wrong here? Does that look like too many parameters to you? 92 million. Vit ninety three million. What's going on here? One, two. Maybe this needs to be negative one. Ah, oh. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Hmm. Oh, why is this up here? I think there may be. Yeah. Okay, so that is strange to me how it constructs the transformer encoder because the total number of parameters that we're going for here is if we go to torch vision models, we want it to equal something very close to what PyTorch have as their So this is the PyTorch magic number. Yeah, okay. So I think if we create it with, so you see here, this is the number of parameters there. If we create it, it's, it looks like it's making one extra. one extra layer here. So maybe I should ins just instantiate this right here. Let's see what happens there. Okay, I see. There we go. So that's the proper usage of that, I guess. All right, well, that's good to know. Five. Create a single transformer. Stack it n times. All right, so we've got our vision transformer. Let's now move on to the next exercise. So that was exercise one. See, it took us a fair while. What are we, an hour and a half in just to do one exercise. 
Straight up menace to society using light mode. <laughs> what, should I do dark mode on this? Does Colab even have a dark mode? Dark mode. Dark. How's that? Do we want dark mode or light mode? Personally, I prefer light mode. Because really, I only code through the day. Okay, so I'm going to put a timestamp here. A timestamp. I'm going to transcode this video later on. For exercise two. So we want to turn the custom vid architecture. I'll just run all of these. Will this work? We create it into a Python script. For example, vit.py. Yeah, for some reason, I think light mode is easier on stream. I don't know. If you want to change it, let me know. So let's do this. What we want to do is have over here a module called vit.py that we could just import our vision transformer. Vit by going, this is the ideal state that we want. So from vit import vid right so let's see if we can do that let's go code and we want to go we'll use the python magic write file vit.py uh, print hello world i'm vid.py is this going to work and then if we run python vit.py, yeah, there we go. So all we, all we have to do for that, this is actually quite an easy exercise. Now that we've coded, we've done the big part. We'll get our vit class, bring it down here. And for some reason, this is not giving me, I wonder if that'll work if I just do a single, we'll find out. So import, let's get torch from torch import nn. Uh, it'll error out and tell us if we miss anything. We need our patch embedding class and I actually think that's all we need. Patch embedding. Let's copy all of our VIT model dependencies, dependencies to a single cell and write it to file using the magic write file. Let's see if this works, hey? Overriding vit.py, what happens if we run it? Nothing. Can we import vit and say imported vit? equals vit and then we want to go summary imported vit and then input size equals one three two 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 four two two four two two four let's see hey there we go we have a vision transformer in a single dot pi file 
So if we go over to vit here, vit.py, wonderful. So looks like we can do a forward pass on our, we have a vision transformer. If we cut out this in under, a, let's just say 100 lines of code, a full vision transformer. And most of that is the patch embedding class. Well, and you could tidy up the patch embedding class by putting that, the class token and the positional embedding inside the patch embedding class. That's a, a notable extension here, but vit.py, this is inspired by uh, probably my favorite Vit PyTorch, Vision Transformer repo from LucidRains on GitHub. So vit.py, yeah. There's a little bit more going on in this one, um, such as the that Lucid Reigns doesn't use a uh, convolutional layer. They use the uh, iron ops, rearrange and whatnot. So I'm not sure which one is better. I think they do the same thing. Potentially rearrange is faster in terms of training, but I haven't done any benchmarking. So check that out if you like, but that's vit.py. Now you can just import a whole vision transformer by running a single line of code. Vit.py, beautiful. So I'm going to put a timestamp here for a timestamp for exercise three. So now we want to train a pre-trained VIT feature extractor like the one we made in 08 PyTorch paper replicating section 10 on 20% of the pizza, steak and sushi data like the data set we used in 07. Okay, so there's a fair bit we have to unpack here. So a VIT feature extractor model. So let's go create VIT feature extractor model. And then we also have to um, uh, get 20% of the data. And then let's go examine results. So from helper functions, import plot loss curves. Do we have helper functions? I think we do. Plot loss curves. Okay, so let's go import Torch Vision. So I'll just show you what we did in PyTorch replicating, paper replicating section 10. Let's see if this works. Does it take me to section 10? Hey, it didn't take me to section 10. Ah, because it's got code in the heading. I think that might be why it works. So why use a pre-trained model? Now, if you go off what the paper said to train the VIT model, the vision transformer, it was pre-trained on the public ImageNet 21K data set and performs well on most data sets too while taking fewer resources to pre-train. So it could be trained using a standard cloud TPU V3 with eight cores in approximately 30 days. Now, I don't know if you have 30 days or the fact that if you wanted to rent a, a cloud TPU V3 with eight cores, let's look at the pricing for that. So TPU V3, eight cores is on demand, $8 an hour USD. So if you rent it for a month straight, it would cost you about 6,000 US dollars. Now, I personally don't have that money to invest in pre-training a vision, vision transformer. Hence why I would go to a place like torchvision.models or torch image models library, the Tim library or the Hugging Face Hub to find a pre-trained model. And luckily for, for us, we have lots of pre-trained models available in torchvision.models. So, if we were to train this vision transformer from scratch, 
on 20% of the data, which is only about 400 images, we would likely get quite poor results as we did in uh, section eight. We trained a model on our data set, 10% of the data that is, which was only 200 and something images. But because how big the VIT model is, it's about 86 million parameters, it wasn't able to learn anything worthwhile in our small data set, which is why the original paper performed so well on a large data set, because that's generally the case with transformers is they need a large amount of data. There are different versions that can work with less data, but let's just go, the overarching thing here is that if you just want to leverage a uh, state-of-the-art architecture that has been pre-trained somewhere else, you can generally get great results with a pre-trained model. So let's see what we can do here um, with Torch Vision. So let's go vit weights equals torchvision.models. Um, we're going to get uh, vit b16 weights here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can use ImageNet weights. So this model has been trained on ImageNet and currently gets the results 81% accuracy on top one. ImageNet is 1.3 million images of a thousand classes. So such as Tench, Goldfish, uh, Great White Shark. What is a Tench? A European freshwater fish. Didn't even know that. So a thousand classes. Let's import this, these pre-trained weights, but adjust them for our food vision mini problem, which is classifying images of pizza, steak, and sushi. So pizza, steak, sushi, test, train. These images have been pulled from um, the Food 101 data set, which is also in PyTorch. Under data sets, Food 101. So all I've done is I've taken a random subset of the pizza, steak, and sushi classes, 10%, to start small. Get something working on a small data set and then scale up when you need to. So vit B16 weights. But I'm gonna set this to default because default means best available. Default means best available. Uh, so then if we go vitweights.transforms, what do we get? This might download something. Oh. Uh, so I want to, I'll get this down in here. Pre-process the data. And then I want to train train a pre-trained VIT feature extractor. So pre-trained VIT will be equal to dot models dot VIT B16. Now this is confusing to me, is that they use capitals for the weights, but don't for the models, I don't think. We'll find out in a second, won't we? Are we gonna get errors? Pre-trained VIT. Yeah, so that's downloading some weights from PyTorch. Beautiful, and then we get a bunch of layers here which have some pre-trained weights. However, we have the head here, which is the MLP head. This has out features of a thousand. We would like to change that to our class or to our number of classes. And we'd like to freeze all the base layers because we won't, we don't want to update them during training when we're just using a feature extractor model. We would rather, rather than update these pre-trained weights during training on our own custom data set, we just want to leverage them. So all we're going to train is the output layer. So let's see what that looks like. So download, pre-trained VIT weights and model. So we want to freeze all layers in 
pre-trained VIT model. So um, for param in pre-trained VIT dot parameters, param dot, we, we can freeze them by setting their requires grad. So requires grad stands for requires gradient. Uh, in deep learning, the way we update weight parameters is using the algorithm gradient descent. Now, PyTorch is going to track the gradients of all of our parameters behind the scenes, but using the requires grad attribute. But if we set it to false, it means it's not going to keep track of those gradients, so they won't be updated via gradient descent. And then maybe we, do we have the set seeds function? So set seeds is just going to set the um, GPU seed and the um, non-GPU seed here. So update the pre-trained VIT head. So um, we want pre-trained VIT dot head because we want to grab this head layer, which is the MLP head or maybe heads dot heads. Let's change that. Dot heads equals nn dot sequential, and we want in features equals or oh, sorry. Uh, we want nn dot layer norm, and then we want nn dot uh, linear. In features equals embedding dim. Maybe we set the embedding dim up here. Embedding dim equals. 768, this is going to be VIT base because that's the model we've imported here. VIT B stands for VIT base and 16 stands for the patch size. We'll set the seeds. Layer norm, we'll go normalized shape equals embedding dim. And then we'll go out features equals um, length of our class names. And then we can get a summary of our pre-trained VIT. Get a summary. Summary model equals VIT. Uh, import size equals one, three, Two two four, two two four. Let's see what we get. Beautiful. Uh, let's get a little bit more info. Summary. Yeah, there's a few more parameters that we can pass to summary here. I might just do one. There we go, okay. So, the only layer that is trainable here is the output. That's what we want. So all of the base layers here are frozen. So now we've got a pre-trained VIT we need to get some data and we need to transform it. So process the data. So VIT transforms. Did I save that? I didn't save that before. We can get the transforms from the VIT weight, VIT weights. So if we have a look at there, VIT transforms. <coughs> We want to get 20% of the data. Excuse me, my nose is getting a bit blocked. So I've got a function in here called download data. Download data, which comes from helper functions. But this says, Experiment tracking 7.3. Let's see if this takes us to the right place. 
7.3, download different data sets. Okay, so we can download the 20% data by just copying this, download data. And then we can set up the directories with that. So let's start by downloading the data. Set up um, train and test directories. Train to 20% equals um, this path slash train. And then we want equals. Now, is this, can you do this trick in Colab? Oh, double cursor. Look at that, that's epic. So all we're going to do is download the 20% data. So in section eight, we trained a vision transformer feature extractor with 10% of the data. And we got pretty darn good results. So yeah, image path, this was 10%. So pizza, steak, sushi, that's 10% of the data. And then we had a look at the loss curves and our model did outstanding. But then we compared it to uh, the efficient net B2 feature extractor that we trained in section seven. And we found that the model size of the efficient net B2 was 29 megabytes for a very comparable loss and or test loss and test accuracy value or performance metric to the VIT feature extractor. So the VIT feature, feature extractor was the best performing model in terms of performance metrics. But in terms of model size, it was 11 times bigger than the efficient net B2 feature extractor. So this is something that you want to, oh, and the premise here, the reason why we're doing this exercise is that efficient net B2 model in reference, so this one here was trained with 20% of the data, so double the data. But the main concern here is that, is the increase in model size worth the trade-off? So what I mean by that is that when you're deploying your models, if we wanted to deploy our food vision model to say a mobile device, and it's performing quite well here, so you're really only getting about a 1% boost in accuracy on the test data set, but for 11 times bigger model, you're gonna to have to ask yourself, is that worth it? In some applications, maybe yes, but in other applications such as a mobile device, uh, loading a VIT feature extractor might not even be possible because it's so such a big file uh, and it may take longer to run inference. So it might not be the, the best experience. So just something to keep in mind. But now we're going to level the playing field with this exercise. We're going to train a VIT feature extractor on the same data as this model was trained on. And perhaps the loss and accuracy gap widens but the model size will probably say the same. So let's have a look, hey? Um, so there's our transforms that we can get. Fit weights, so we want to get the transforms from the VIT weights uh, because when you use a pre-trained model, you want to uh, format your data in the same way that the pre-trained model was trained on, otherwise you might get performance issues. So let's create the data loaders. Oh, I just realized that we actually use the same test, the 10% test data set. So there's an issue here with what we're doing. We need to get both data sets, or actually, I can just get test data loader. Yes. Don't need 20% test data as uh, the model in I just remembered the model in PyTorch experiment tracking. So tests on the 10% data set. 
data set, not the 20%. <coughs> so I just realized that this model here, these test values are on the same test data set as these values, except they were trained on different data sets. So to keep the th results consistent, we want to keep the same test data set, but update the training data set. So that's what we'll do here. So test data loader. Now, if we just have a look, what happened here? If we look up tester. Yeah, so pizza, steak, sushi, test. There. equals data setup. Trainer equals trainer 20%. Tester equals tester. So use 10%. batch size, we're gonna use an increased batch size here. Because we're using a feature extractor model, uh, we can get away with a larger batch size because we're not updating as many parameters. So the reason why we used a lower batch size before a 32 is because fitting a whole transformer in GPU memory is, is a challenge. So we can, the thing that we can sort of tweak to make sure our model fits into memory is the batch size. So that means if we process less samples at the one time, uh, it's not gonna cram up our memory. So because we're using feature extraction, we can upgrade the batch size. And I think that's actually all we need. Oh, the transform, of course. Transform equals vit transforms. So it's gonna download the 20% data and then create the train data loader 20% and test data loader. So let's have a look. I actually don't want to call that that. bit all over the shop there with that keyboard oh no what's happened here oh because there's only one batch because the batch size is so large okay double the batches if we use 32 but oh maybe we just stick it at no we'll stick it at 24 why don't we do that? That'll do. Okay, now we can train it. So let's set the seeds. We need an optimizer. Do we have our model? We have our model. Optimizer, they use the um, atom optimizer in the paper with a learning rate of one E negative three. And loss, we're going to use torch.nn.crossentropy loss. Funny fact about the, the vision transformer paper is there's no mention of loss, a loss function throughout the entire paper. It's kind of just assumed that you know, um, or criterion, or cross entropy, or anything to do with entropy. It's kind of just assumed that you know they use cross entropy. So yeah, using Adam, we'll just make sure we use the same one as here. Oh, wow. Oh, we need to pass in the parameters of our pre-trained vit.params. 
color. And we need to, from going modular, going modular, import engine, which is going to be our training engine. And we'll bring this down here. Set seeds, and then we can bring in all of this. Copying too much code here. So this is where we need to update the train data loader 20%. And this can just stay as test data loader. And then the optimizer will be the optimizer. The device will be the device. Let's see, are we off to the races here? Three, two, one, training a vision transformer with 20% of pizza, steak and sushi data. Oh. What did I get wrong here? Parameters. Okay, so this shouldn't take too long. It's getting close to 90% accuracy. Where do you think it's going to end up? We're looking at above 95. Would be ideal. Oh, more data doesn't necessarily help. One more epoch. Had a little bit of a bump there. Oh, much lower loss though. So there's some pretty good curves. So we get a lower loss, but not as high accuracy with more data. So our model is less wrong, but also less right. So that's just something to think about. We could try with more data, we could try different things, we could try different batch size. But let's now move on to exercise four. So that was exercise three. Train a pre-trained VIT feature extractor model like the one we made in PyTorch replicating section 10. Now, oh yeah, if we compare it to efficient net B2, The value we got, it's actually lower than efficient net B2's accuracy, but the loss is also, well, 1.5 or 0 0.15 lower. So, but we're also gonna have a model that's 11 times bigger. So that's just something to think about. Now, these two models have been trained and evaluated on the same data sets. So one is 11 times smaller, with a slightly higher accuracy, but a lower loss, a higher loss, sorry. And one is 11 times bigger, but with slightly better performance metrics. Something to think about if you were going to put this into production. So let's now replicate the steps from, oh, wait, I'm gonna put a timestamp here. I'm gonna put a timestamp <laughs> uh, for step four, exercise four. So we want to repeat the steps from exercise three here. This should be, this is a typo. This should be uh, exercise three. But this time use some different weights. Okay, I'm just gonna change the typo here before I forget. This is the ground truth notebook. So if we have a look at the Vision Transformer base patch size 16 weights, there's actually a few options here. We have 
ImageNet 1K V1, or we have Swag Enter End V1, or we have Swag Linear V1. <coughs> Excuse me. So the difference here is that these weights are from the Swag data set. So revisiting weekly supervised pre-training of visual perception models. So yeah, they supervise weekly through hashtags. So essentially these weights are trained on a lot bigger data set, but the data set isn't as well labeled as ImageNet. However, due to the power of the transformer, they looks like they perform better on ImageNet. So this is 85.3 accuracy on top one and this is 81.072. So let's see what it's like if we import these weights and redo that training schedule that we just did and see if the results improve. Oh, we need to make sure our image is a size 384. Let's see how we can do that. So we'll start by just copy this. But this time we want ImageNet swag end to end. Vit weights swag, swag, swag. Is that where we want? Yeah, swag. Pre-trained vit swag. Pre-trained vit swag. Now, do we have a way to format our image size here? I think when we create Maybe we just try it with images of 224 and see what happens. Swag. So swag, 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 swag. <laughs> so this model has swag, let's see what happens. We'll download it. Uh, Vit B16 swag. Wrong image height. Okay, so I think we need 384 here. Okay, we do need 384. So let's see what happens when we create our data loaders. So we'll just bring this down here. Now, if we go into create data loaders, data loaders, data setup, it'll be in transforms, won't it? It weights swag. This is the power of using a pre-trained model. There we go, crop size and resize. So it resizes for us. How good is that? Vit transforms swag. So this is how quickly we can start to use different pre-trained models. So this is the, the great update to Torch Vision uh, version 0.13 for um, pre-trained VIP 
soin. Note, uh, vit, pre-trained with swag, input image size of so this is accessible in the weights transforms method So we'll get that, then we'll pre-process pre our data. And now we should be able to just train the model. So let's just copy this. Training code. Change this to swag. And we'll also change this to swag. Optimizer. Let's see if this does any better than our previous model. So from helper functions. Oh no. CUDA out of memory. <laughs> I think we need to lower the batch size. So let's lower the batch size to 32. So CUDA out of memory. Potentially the batch size was too large for our device. Oh my gosh. Ninety seven percent accuracy on the first oh my friends. <laughs> this is incredible. We're gonna push a hundred close to a hundred percent accuracy here. Ninety nine percent accuracy. I'd be interested to see what Examples it got wrong if it's that good already. Okay, so Looks like the swag weights are performing at nearly, I wonder if we change the, the, the batch size up here, would we get a different result? Might train that model again after this. Ninety nine percent accuracy after two epochs is pretty darn good. Training, it's got 100% training, 100% on the training data set.
Okay, so this finished as our best performing model. 99. We're retraining our normal VIT with a batch, lower batch size. Okay, so that's... Maybe the larger batch size wasn't as good as we thought it was. Oh, it's fluctuating a bit. So the swag weights turned out to be incredibly helpful. And we get the best performing model of the entire course. So training is a little bit more fluctuated with a batch size of 32 with our pre-trained VIT without the swag weights. But then with the swag weights, uh, we get some outstanding results basically straight away. Near perfect. Okay, so that would be something to try out. Would be to see which examples did it get wrong. Now, do we want to do that instead of just defining what these are? So this is exercise five. Uh, our custom VIP model architecture closely. I could put a timestamp here to say that the swag weights a timestamp, timestamp, just to make sure the transcription picks it up. I'd like to investigate this. Our custom VIT model architecture closely mimics that of the VIT paper. However, our training represent our training recipe misses a few things. So. This one to research is not as fun as plotting images from the test data set. I wanna see which ones it got wrong. So I'm gonna leave this for you to explore on your own if you're watching this in the future, but research the, uh, a few topics because our custom VIT implementation misses a few things out that they did in the training setup, such as ImageNet 22K pre-training. So that just means that it pre-trained on ImageNet 22K to learn patterns. Learning rate warm-up is instead of when you train a big model, instead of starting at a certain learning rate, you might spend a few thousand steps warming up to that learning rate to prevent your loss from exploding. Learning rate decay is over time you might lower your learning rate. Uh, I, I like to think of the analogy as when you're reaching for a coin at the back of a cushion, the closer you get to the coin, the smaller your hand movements so you could imagine it's similar, the closer a model gets to peak performance, you want to slowly but surely update it till it gets right to that end point. If you do too big of an update, so too big of a learning rate, your loss might explode. Similarly to if you were reaching for a coin and you get really close, but then you reach too far, you might lose the coin to the back of the couch. And gradient clipping is a similar sort of concept. A lot of these are to prevent overfitting. Uh, gradient clipping is you clip, so you cut your gradients or some of your gradients, um, which is the parameters of how much your model updates uh, the, the, as you go along. So instead of your gradients exploding, you clip them at a certain point to prevent them from going too high. Uh, but you can, you can look those up. I've just explained them at a high level. Um, let's... Let's make some predictions to finish off this stream, hey? Let's predict, because this model is performing quite well on our test data set. So I think I've got some code in here to go most wrong. This is one of the things I like to do. refresh this okay looks like it's not working maybe it's in transfer learning oh we did that in 06 we did that as part of an exercise 
Okay. So that will be in GitHub. Extras, solutions, most wrong. Okay. So we're gonna copy some code from here. Might just open this in Colab. Most wrong means, uh, first and foremost, we wanna find out where our model um, went wrong, but we also wanna find out where it went most wrong. So that means uh, the prediction is wrong, but the prediction probability is also high. So most wrong. Wow. I wonder, I think this will work. If we just bring in this code here. So the model I want, let's see if this works, is a pre-trained swag, pre-trained vit swag. And the transforms I want is uh, pre-trained vit, where are the transforms? What do I call those? Vit transform swag. TQDM, that's fine. From TQDM. Easy money, look at that. Nice and quick. Okay, looks like it's got basically all of them correct so far. Let's turn it into a dictionary. Oh, sorry, a data frame. It got one wrong. So let's go test pred df dot correct dot value count. It got one wrong out of our whole data set, <laughs> which is, do we have a plot here? Oh, look at this. We wrote some code in a previous notebook and this is helping us out tremendously. How many samples from the test data set? So it predicted pizza, sorry, it predicted steak for this, but it should be pizza. So this is a wrong label. 
So we just found an error in the Food 101 data set. <laughs> Steak, pizza, wow. Okay, so the swag weights for the VIT model are pretty darn good, but I feel like that's what we've covered. And then, yeah, we, we kind of stepped through this, but I'll, you can go, this is just Googling topics and writing a sentence about each. But we did the fun part of writing code. So I'm going to save this into GitHub. So if you want this on the course GitHub, you might already have it already if you're watching this video in the future, but if you're watching it live, you can check it out basically in a second. Extras, solutions, uh, it'll go there. Add solutions for 08. No typos. Beautiful. Uh, but yeah, a few errors there, just some pre-processing stuff, and we ran into a CUDA error because our batch size was too big. That'll probably happen if you use larger and larger models. Again, we're limited to a single GPU here on Colab, um, but we saw just how powerful using a pre-trained model can be. And we got nearly perfect accuracy on our test data set. So we saw a model that could achieve basically 100% accuracy um, on our test data set. The only sample it got wrong was because the label is not correct. That's not a steak to me, that's a burger. So the true label says pizza here, but that's, that's a hamburger in terms of Food 101. So if you want this notebook, it's on GitHub now. And I'm gonna upload this live stream to YouTube so you can watch it later. But otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next section. We got model deployment. Very exciting. Peace.